So you graduated what year? 41. December 7, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. In a couple of years, I was drafted in 1943. Well, I had to go for complete physical. I went into went to Erie for that. I think I went down to Indian Town Gap, I think it was. I know that's where I got discharged too out of there, but then the next one we shipped down into Hattiesburg, Mississippi, down to Camp Shelby. They just activated a new division at that point, 69th Division. They call it the Fighting Ninth or Fighting 69th rather. I trained down there for a year. Fortunately, I went through the basic and stuff, which usually 13 weeks, you know, but I went into advanced infantry where we at least knew what live fire and artillery and mortars and whatnot was over us, you know, so. Mm -hmm. So we did have good, we, we griped every minute about it, but, and the general, he was, his name was Boldy, and we used to call us, or call ourselves the four B's, Boldy's bitching bivouac boys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The next, uh, after we trained that year, we shipped out to, in the spring, up into Fort Meade, I guess it was. We shipped overnight, and that was a little bit, a little bit of a change going up in there. And so we wasn't there too long. We went down to Camp Patrick Henry. That was a point of of uh, of shipping out there. But we didn't ship from there. We went back to I think to Camp Kilmer. Why I don't know. Mm -hmm. And then we got loaded on a ship over there, or in New York, and took off. That was quite impressive. There were ships in all directions. And the U-boats was <laughs> mingled in with them, I guess. German U-boats. And we was on a, about 10 days of shipping over there in the Southampton, England. And that was quite a common place, I guess, for, for all of them to go in you know, over there. And you were in the 29th Division then, right? Yeah. Our division, 29th, got a bad rap there. They, they were, during the invasion, why, uh, they didn't have no place to put prisoners, so as I understood it, I ain't positive, but a lot of the tankers shot them. That's what got them in a bad position. But you had to respect them, you know, too, prisoners. They were there the same as we were. Well, we landed on or Omaha Beach. Mm -hmm. See, I just went as a casualty replacement. Right. A few days after invasion, and we had to, had to uh, board the, these LCI's, landing craft infantry. Mm -hmm. to in order, they couldn't get up close enough to shore, so we had to get out of landing ship. That still didn't get us up there. We had to wade in water up to our chest somewhere in there to get ashore. Now the United States, we'd had control of the beach at that time, right? Oh yeah. yeah. And the beach was quite a number of barrage balloons up there anchored to the ground, of course. Mm -hmm. They had those up there to where Germans couldn't, well if they strafed it, they'd probably cut their wings off. We had to march anyways. Patton had his tanks all lined up ready to go at that point. We hiked by, you know, and we were headed for this St. Lowe, the hedgerow country. Rains that drive inland from the English Channel bog down the Allied armies in the fertile Norman countryside. Ever since D-Day, adverse weather has slowed the liberation of Europe. But as the storms subside, the Yanks get ready for the great push. The Battle of the Hedgerows is on again. This is the beginning of the drive that chased the enemy out of the entire Cotentin Peninsula and placed the Yanks on the Brittany border. Well, they were blocked off in fields. 
or same as we might do with wire fences, you know. And just brush over the top of them. You know, has been there for years and years. And, and uh, their cattle, of course, was fenced in there. They had to get rid of the cows. <laughs> they were they were used by the Germans too. And so really, it's fences. I mean, fencing off property lines. Before I got up there, though, one morning, I, they sent uh, 3,000 aircraft over and leveled the city. I don't know just how big the city was, really, but good size. And uh, we were the first division through it and hadn't prepared us then. But Walking through St. Lowe and you just saw this tremendous destruction. Well, it was just seemed quite impressive or something taking down a whole whole city. <laughs> well, there was walls and stuff, sanding, but, you know. Then there was one general that got killed there, too. Well, we were ready to we'd make an attack on a, in the hedgerows, of course, and, and uh, there was plenty of uh, live fire coming over, those clipping the brush and stuff over them, and so uh, I uh, heard, had heard something pop, you know, or something. And I thought a piece of stone had chipped and hit me, you know, in the front. I always carried my gloves in there, leather face gloves. Mm -hmm. And uh, we always wore a field jacket, and, which was sweat sweating our head off and that thing. We pulled back at that point for a ways not to make the attack, you know, which that did happen now and then. And uh, that's every time you stop, you better start digging in because protected you from, from uh, artillery and mortars. And that's when I discovered the something rattled around my glove. So I spied the culprit that was rattling, <laughs> you know. I carried it around for a while, I don't know where it went. But. You pull out of the gloves and there's a there's a round that was headed Fired. for you. Yeah, yeah. And did you, what was your reaction? Well, it missed me that time, or it didn't. <laughs> Just part of the deal, I guess. That you lost a colleague, he was a casualty of war. Or did you just kind of know that you just got to keep moving? Well, that's probably about the size of it. You had to keep going regardless. And we did go from from there to this uh, seaport breast. Well, that's one thing I didn't like about the tankers. They, they could push their way through, but uh, it's just like snow plowing. The, the troops, German troops, was off to the side, you know. Oh, they said it just a little clean up there. Well, that clean up lasted for seven weeks, and that's where the big railroad guns were stationed. Mm. And when they set one out, you could, you could tell the minute when they set it off, you know, fire. It. Sound about like a freight train going through the. They would make a crater as big as this house. And, that we were out in the field steady abreast seven weeks before we pulled back for replacements and got to clean up a little bit, just like you said. Detail a couple of guys to go out and pick up the wounded and the dead. They wheeled back in there again a whole truckload of bodies on 18 wheelers. Bodies stacked like cordwood. That was a gruesome sight. That must have been just Difficult to see such a, I mean, to visualize that. You begin to wonder at that point who was winning the war, yeah. you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But they would pick up Germans too, you know. You had to, had to respect them, you know. Once in a while they would call off or cease fire for I don't know how many minutes to pick up the wounded and dead or whatever. How did that happen? I imagine it by radio, you know, it did, I assume. Actually, during that time period, you got a lot of promotions. I don't know where that really started, but it started pretty sudden, not too long after I was in, apparently, because, as I say, there was 
we had a sergeant and a lieutenant and where I got involved to begin with, I don't know. Probably, maybe I took off, took took over a little bit more because it was all greenhorns, you know. Then one guy, the second day I think it was, it come up alongside of me, some prisoners was coming out. And he come up alongside of me and fired a rifle grenade out. That took my ears off. You ended up being a leader of a platoon. Yep. You had a bunch of uh, GIs that were in a platoon. Uh, how many were there? Well, the full strength is around at least 36. Right. Yeah. And we're supposed to have an officer besides, which some, sometimes we did and sometimes we didn't. I don't know if they, they uh, got killed or transferred into a different outfit. So a lot of times we didn't have a, I didn't have a, Oh, sure. So wasn't it difficult? I mean, at some point you went, you started off as a private. Next thing you know, you've got a leader of men. <laughs> Did that change your kind of day-to-day -day thinking? Not too much. Only it was, only it was more work, though. So yeah. You had to ch check on them, especially every morning to see if we're still all there. You know, whether it was killed in action or wounded in action or deserter or whatever got you so far to Brest, uh, what, where, where was your next? After that, after that uh, deal there, we, oh, I caught us up in the that Siegfried Line area, up, up in the edge of Belgium and Germany. So we on in on Germany a ways. Westward moving out that one morning uh, up near the Siegfried Line, uh, there were mortars, you know, that put out about a dozen of them in the air before one ever hits. That you were hit in one of your legs. Yeah. Talk we'd, about that. We'd been holding this little town. I don't know how big that was either, but and uh, so they they had this programmed in to to uh, take off from some distance. It was kind of facing this Roar River, which I dreaded and. It was known to be a swift river. And that's when the, of course they had observation on us, and we did on them too, but, uh, so that's what had happened there. We are just getting started, and some of them come in there. When they would fire them, or they would saturate the whole area. You had to get moving out of that, or get caught, really get caught, and, and, so that ended my career in there. It was just getting cold, snowy. Well, about the same as right here in November, middle of the... And it wasn't looking too <laughs> too good there. But, no, we always put up a... We had one sniper rifle. Yeah. I, got, I had one guy get up and take out a window up in the uh, high house there. And uh, he, I don't know, he claimed he had shot one there. We're clearing the town and taking prisoners. And as a platoon leader, you were called into the uh, CP to get briefed on it. We didn't use any artillery to let them know it was coming. We went into the darkness at 4 o'clock in the morning. This sector, your platoon was tasked with clearing contained foxholes that were empty on the pictures. Right. But when you got there, you were surprised. Yeah, yeah, right. I got the article right here, if you like, in this paper here. Stars and Stripes. Want to get this for him? Whenever the overlay, as they call it, was taken, I, they were pictured as empty mm -hmm. sectors I was supposed to go in. Well, I found out different, of course. So what happened then? Oh, well, we had to take... we. There wasn't a lot of, I was supposed to go in and um, make a lot of noise going in, hooping it up, because it was entirely dark and no artillery or mortars or nothing to alert them it was coming in. And took engineers, 
to blow up some buildings. Well, they couldn't. They didn't. Lo couldn't locate that outfit in there, and I don't really know. Whatever they did determine, but. Uh, the German village wiped out in a dawn attack by Yanks. The German battalion had turned the village into a fortress. And that your men slipped through the defense squad by squad before they were detected. Enemy rifle shots rang out and then the Americans opened fire on gun emplacements, house fortresses, and backyard bivouacs. There were no civilians left in the town, so when the infantrymen met the stubborn resistance from a house, they called up the engineers who planted charges and blew the house to bits. Before the battle was over, 31 houses were leveled with dynamite charges. Within an hour after the commando-type attack, German tanks supported by the infantry rumbled down the road. So there you were. Yeah, yeah. That was a wild time. We sent to a hospital in Belgium. For a day or two. Yep. And then the, that's when these, uh, Hitler's bombs was over. There's one and two. The V1s them. and V2s? Buzz bombs, as they call them. Yeah. You could hear them? Oh, yeah. They sound like a freight train going through the air. And when I was in that uh, Belgium hospital, I, you could hear them cutting, the engine cutting off. That didn't sound too impressive there. I flew over on a C-47. It's a cargo or a transport plane in the litter cases. While you're sitting in the hospital, did you assume that you'd, that's where you'd be going home, back to the... Well, it was pretty close. Yeah. I, uh, of course, got hit in the leg there, and my heel, uh, well, it sounds funny, I know, wasn't well, healing up is draining yet, and so had a German, German, uh, Jewish doctor there, and he says, well, McIntyre, he says, I'll send you for some more x-rays, and which I went, and come back a chip fracture and that that uh, Z I you know that what, no what's that that's what the states was called zone of the interior heading home huh heading home yeah so well, that's the only time in my life I ever paid to open my mouth <laughs> <laughs> usually in trouble I well, we I went home on a Queen Elizabeth that was a big Luxury ship, the biggest one in the world, I guess, and mm -hmm. that was converted somewhat into a troop ship. Oh, no, it took about four days to get in New York with on that. That would that would uh, sail zigzagging alone, nothing with it. Be a harder target to hit with a sub, you know. The Japanese have accepted our terms fully. That's the word we've just received from the White House in Washington. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the end of the Second World War. When they dropped the A-bomb on the Japans, that's what ended it right there. But actually, I went over there as a loner, and I didn't know anybody, of course, with the, I trained with. We all went in different outfits. So that's probably just as well, too. You know. You you were awarded a lot. You were awarded a Purple Heart, yeah. the Combat Infantry Badge, the Bronze Star, the American Campaign Medal. I mean, it goes on and on and on. What's the one you, you feel the most proud of? So you got the Combat Infantry Badge, and that's worn at the top, right? That is a, my main main one right there. And and why would why did you receive that? Well, just because designation was in combat, they weren't just dealed out or doled out for each and every one. You'll see sometimes in generals and stuff on the TV that's that's worn over top of all your ribbons. Mm -hmm. And not only that, the good part, maybe ten bucks a month more. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. That was the most impressive part from the cross yeah. rifles. Yeah. That's known as a ruptured duck. Ah, oh, I've heard the term. <laughs> Never saw yeah. it. Well, that's, that designated you. You had to have that sewed and not that one, but a, one same thing on your blouse and stuff when you got discharged. I guess I probably inclined to be 
compared to what we got going on today, which that was extremely important because Hitler was out to get all of Europe, I guess. Mm -hmm. And once he got that way, he would be going further over here, no doubt. And uh, so that's kind of the impression I had anyway. Came home that day that you knocked on the door and said, I'm home. What was that reunion like? Fantastic. <laughs> you know, that's the one I had lettered up McIntyre my name and there. stuff oh, on it. But, yeah. uh, well, there's a photo op, I'm telling you. Put those together with Justin. That's what happened to my hair. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We didn't wear the chin straps. Uh huh. Because the reason why they claim with a close artillery hit, they would could snap your neck. And ah. The big shots pull in. They didn't like that not wearing a chin strap. This has been great, Lyle, and I really appreciate you opening up your home and sharing all of these uh, items. Well, I probably could think back a lot more. It's really the tip of the iceberg, I guess you might say. Yeah.